Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for Phenology with Appalachian Headwaters. My name is Kristen Wickert. And I'm Ivy Makia. And we're going to start tonight by going over a quick outline, outline of the topics, topics we'll discuss tonight. tonight. First, First off, I want to say thank you for joining us. us. We're going to learn about who is Appalachian Headwaters. I'm sure some of you have seen us on Facebook advertising for a couple of events we have coming up, like Nature Walks and Educator Workshops. So we'll go over who we are and what we're hoping to do in West Virginia. We're going to talk about what is phenology for a main portion of this talk. Why is phenology important in understanding climate change? How we can document phenology utilizing apps like iNaturalist and Nature's Notebook. And we'll show you a few observations that have already been studied by scientists that we're going to talk about phenological trends. We're also going to tell you about our exciting new project, the Phenology Trail, that we're going to establish at our park here in Greenbrier County. So you may have heard of us a few ways, and I'm, I'm going to let Ivy describe, describe all of the different ways that you may have heard of us. <laughs> Hi, I am Ivy. I'm an environmental educator with Appalachian Water. So uh, Appalachian Headwaters is a nonprofit organization focused on community development, ecological restoration, and ed environmental education uh, throughout central Appalachia. So one of the programs that we run is Camp Waldo, which is an environmental education summer camp for fourth to eighth graders in Hinton, West Virginia. We also have uh, restoration projects on reclamation sites, mine sites. We also have Appalachian Beekeeping Collective, ABC for short, which is a beekeeping co-op for all ages. We also have a number of community science projects that we run like the um, nature walks and the environmental presentations like this one. And we also so have the environmental, environmental education, education program and through that program we have a high school internship. We also offer scholarship for high schoolers. Uh, we have an upcoming educator workshop and uh, more to come in the future. And we also have the native plant project where we are currently growing about 16,000 native plants. Which are going to be planted and live at our Appalachian Pollinator Center here in Greenbrier County, where we have 150 acres that we are planning on planting wildflower meadows of native plants. We do have a pond. We also have high ridges that are filled with oak trees and we have supplemented the entire area. You can see our awesome diagram down here. We have planted over what, 600 trees of, mm -hmm. that are native varieties. And we've done a lot of native plant surveys in the area. It's been a lot of fun. But the plan for this pollinator center is to build an environmentally friendly designed education center that has a conference room for about 100 people. So organizations like yours can contact us and ask us if you'd like to have us present to you for a certain topic, or maybe we can host an event that your organization is doing. We'll also have a education uh, lab, which will have microscopes, soil sifting devices, and we hope to host classrooms there to teach them about the wonderful and wild state that we all live in and love. And the property We'll have native plant gardens with educational paths. You can see one right here that we are taking those 16,000 plants and putting them in ne next spring. And all of this is slated to be finished in July of 2022. So that's this year. And we currently have that large environmentally friendly building being built. It's really exciting. Every time we go there, there's a new development and it's exciting to see the future of the, the Appalachian Pollinator Center. Center. But, but currently, currently it's, it's only available to scheduled events, events and tours that are usually led by myself and Ivy. And we're preparing for it to be part of the community in the future where there'll be more open access and we are establishing some trails with educational signage and we're gonna have a couple of events there, but that's all in the future. But one of the reasons we're talking about the Appalachian Pollinator Center is because we are working on establishing a phenology trail there. So we're gonna dive into what is phenology and have you understand it so that way hopefully you can join us on one of these tours down here in Greenbrier County. So let's start by talking about what is phenology, right? Phenology refers to 
phenomena, right? So pheno translates into phenomena and ology translates into the science of. So this is the science of phenomena in nature. We look at the perennial events. <laughs> we look at the perennial events and like annual markers throughout the season to see what is happening with a plant, a butterfly, a snake in their life cycle. But these things are being impacted by climate change, which is really interesting because it's actually something that we can measure in our park in Lewisburg, West Virginia. And we're hoping to contribute that data to scientists. And this term has been around for a really long time. It was first used in literature in 1853 by a botanist, but now we're actually discovering that we have the tools to really make large observations of what phenology is, and we're hoping that we can teach you how to contribute by monitoring phenology in your backyard. So factors that contribute to phenology, this changing of cycles, these annual perennial events in organisms, are things that are really easy to understand, like sunlight. And I included this picture here to show that if any of you have a shaded woodlot as a backyard, the back of your yard, right, it probably doesn't have a lot of plants here, or if the plants that are here are the same as here, they're not doing as well or progressing as much in their flowering or producing of seeds as the plants that are out in full sunlight. There's also the factor of temperature. So we have this cute little lizard hanging out here on a rock, and when, temp you know, temperature in these cold-blooded animals gets to a certain point, it signifies them to do certain life cycle processes. That's the same for plants, all sorts of things. Precipitation, such as rain or snow, plays a very large part in an organism's life cycle and what they're going to do next and what they're gonna to prepare to do next, as well as humidity, which is kind of a combination of these three, right? And there's other life controlling factors, just like every type of science, there's a weird caveat or a weird factor of it that influences in a big way, such as chemicals that might be in the environment that dissipate out at different times of years, or maybe enzymes that have certain chemical boundaries, right? So we all have enzymes in our body that make us be able to break down food or to turn some kind of food into energy. These enzymes are in living creatures just like plants and this cute little lizard here. And phenology is something that we can study year after year after year. So here's a graph that has a calendar year here at the bottom. And the particular thing it's studying is NDVI, which isn't important. What's important in this example is just looking at the graph. So we can see that we have a start phenology. So the first time someone looked at an organism's life cycle, it followed a, a thing where it was in, inactive. And then April, it just did its thing and petered out for the next year. Well, phenology can be act, impacted by shifts in when it happens. So we can have things occurring earlier, like this green dot. And we can also have a broadening of season, like this dark blue dot. So we can have seasons expand when we have things that are affected by the sunlight, the temperature, and also the amount of precipitation. And we can even have changes in amplitude, which means occurrence, right? So it's kind of like the intensity, which is represented by this pink line. And why does understanding phenology matter? Well, there's a lot of reasons, right? So we kind of are focusing a little bit on how interesting climate change studies are with considering phenology, but we can look at things like these studying phenology can help us prepare for impactful events in farming, right? I'm sure some of you are familiar with the farmer's almanac, right? And you know about frost dates. Well, that's based off of many years of studying phenology and knowing when plants emerge and when the weather is doing this versus that in order for you to grow plants successfully in your garden. They can help us protect vulnerable species because we can know that there are certain organisms that only live within this temperature range. And if the temperature range goes over here, we might not see that organism anymore and invasive species management, which we have a whole slide about. We can understand subspecies and speciation. So there's, if any of you are mushroom hunters, you probably know that this is a russula, which is really common in West Virginia, but like, you'll just say that's a russula because that's how it is. But when you start to learn that you can identify that there's different species between the, in this tricky genus of mushrooms, they can actually be told apart partially by the fact that one of them fruits in May and the other one fruits in July. So we can understand what kind of subspecies or species we have based off of when they fruit 
or bloom or emerge. And phenology might explain range extensions or habitat condensing, condensing where it's actually getting smaller for organisms. We can care and provide food for habitat for pollinators for a balanced diet, like these monarchs that are visiting some goldenrod down here. Goldenrod is that beautiful yellow flower that's all over West Virginia in the fall. And if we didn't have fall blooming food for these migrating monarchs, they would be in a lot of trouble, right? And they can help us monitor trends and prepare for changes in our environment. Because if we have someone who's paying attention that the goldenrod are starting to bloom later and later and later, this might become a problem for our mar migrating monarchs. And climate change will impact phenology and it makes, it's a real thing to start to consider, but we don't have a lot of information, but we, we have a lot of grad students, we have a lot of scientists, and we have a lot of community scientists like you and I that are contributing to make this story more in depth. And so burning fossil fuels and meat production at our current rates are expected to influence the temperature of our planet around an average of 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit with kind of a big range between 0 0.3 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit. So 8 degrees, right? Think about the difference between 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 98 degrees Fahrenheit, besides being a really bad band back in the 90s. But 8 degrees, that's a lot. <laughs> but the, uh, the fact that this will affect things that are like, you know, we're sweating and we can go in the air conditioning, but a lot of organisms can't in our West Virginia state, right? So we can monitor these phenological events and help scientists better understand the impacts of climate change and the pro problems that they might impose on an ecosystem, such as there's implications for carbon cycles, availability for fresh water, resource production such as fruit, vegetables, and timber. And there are actual ob observations down here. This USGS map is showing that there are vegetables and fruits that are blooming 20 days earlier because of changes in temperature that they think are associated with climate change. So ultimately, this information serves to better inform us on how the severity of an ecosystem collapse might happen, but we can also do things to hopefully help this problem, right? This is not a scary talk, it's just a factual talk, and it shows you some really interesting stories and things that you can do to help out in monitoring phenology. And this is a, just a really good example of hands-on West Virginian examples I wanted to share with you, because if you have a garden, right, if you eat wildflowers, vegetables, you might have to do something called uh, stratification of your seeds, right, where there are things within the seed that control the amount of temperature that it needs in consecutive amount of days for it to germinate, right? So there are certain like thresholds of degree days that organisms need to thrive. So that affects us and how we can plant things. And then also uh, things like disease prevention, the longer we have of colder winters can prevent things like this happening to our strawberries as much. And it also can kill unwanted pests like the hemlock woolly adelgid. So this is something that's hit West Virginia forests uh, pretty hard. It's a small insect. If you go for a hike anywhere in West Virginia, there's a pretty big chance you're gonna see these small little bugs on the underside. Well, if we have enough cold weather in consecutive days, they can be killed without the use of pesticide and stuff like that. But since weather is becoming warmer in the winter time, like we just had rain here today instead of snow, uh, these can be a problem and they can get worse and worse and worse. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ivy to discuss guess what weather versus climate is. <laughs> Hello again. Um, so it might seem like a bit of a backtrack to talk about the differences between weather and climate, but I think um, understanding uh, the differences between the two is very vital in terms of how we um, look at phenology, because um, it can be easy to conflate what is um, weather dependent changes and um, impacts versus climatic change impacts on phenology. So 
Whether for one, if you're looking at this infograph, is a short-term state of, of the atmosphere, whereas climate is the long-term pattern of weather. So weather is something that we determine on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas climate is looking at weather patterns over a much longer period of time. Um, climate is a major factor in controlling phenology. Um, here's a quote here that says, climate tells you what kind of clothes to buy, but weather tells you what kind of clothes to wear. Mm -hmm. So how we know to buy warmer clothes for the winter versus knowing whether or not to have an umbrella for the next day. That's the difference between climate and weather. And these other points kind of reiterate what I just um, talked about. An example of this is in Santa Barbara, California is characterized as a Mediterranean climate, warm, dry summers and cool, moist winters. There, there are, however, daily and weekly changes in the weather that can rapidly change the temperature, sunshine and wind conditions. So that is an example of the weather patterns as compared to its Mediterranean climate. Okay, so this graph shows how weather uh, or climate is expected to change or temperatures are expected to change over the next 30 years or so. And as you can see in the bottom pictures, the temperatures are getting more intense or increasing. And when you look at states like Florida that are already really hot, it's only gonna get hotter. That's crazy. <laughs> And I'm originally from Florida, so that's how I relate to climate change in my mind or climate and temperatures. As you can see from this graph, or according to the Florida State University, the average beginning of the hot season is in April and it lasts all the way till November. That's a pretty long hot season and it's only going to extend due to climate change. Now, Florida has a ton of data. They've had a lot of research and funding to go towards collecting this amount of information. But when it comes to West Virginia, there's not as much data available, but we can still make inferences as to how we might experience the effects of climate the most. And the reason that there's more information for places like Florida is because as you saw in that temperature graph, Florida is under more threat, right? So we're in a way very lucky to be in West Virginia because we aren't experiencing the crazy stuff that I'm sure you grew up with and saw like increase, but there were, you know, hurricanes, large heat waves. We don't have that as much here, but we do still have it. It's just in a much truncated form, but it is expected to increase. So we will have more data and we do have reasons to care about climate change here, especially when it affects phenology. So getting back now to phenology, now that we're all weather versus climate experts, phenology can be just measured by taking notes, right? So a plant or other organism can be looked at and you can look at certain phenophases, which is in an observable stage or phase in the annual life cycle of a plant or animal that can be, be defined by a starting point and an end point. So you'll make an observation that say that this pink lady slipper, which is in West Virginia, is blooming, right? This is the flower. And there'll be a set period, let's say it blooms May 13th, the flower will be present for about a week and a half. That's a phenophase. And as it develops, it will turn into a seed pod, and that might take a few more weeks. That'll be the next phenophase. So once this flower gets pollinated, it'll turn into a seed pod that will progress and like be a full another phenophase. We also have a phenophase up here too. There's two phenophases within the same picture. So a dandelion in your front yard will have its blooming phenophase and then the seed phenophase. And they typically last for a few days or weeks. So this is why it's important to look at things often that we're trying to study, because I don't know if you've ever been waiting maybe for something like morels to pop up you know, you come to a site and you'll be like, nope, not ready yet, but you know to come back in three days because that's generally when the phenophase of that organism begins, right? And it's extremely sensitive to the changing weather patterns and climatic conditions that Ivy just talked about. 
So what I'll experience is phenophases, because I mean, I'm guilty of it even in this lecture, we've been just saying plants. Well, that's because most of the studies have been about plants because they don't have legs. <laughs> so like you can easily go out and look at that pink lady slipper over and over and over again, because it's going to be there. And you can come back the next year and find that same lady slipper and check it out and document all the different phenophases to the day even to the hour if you wanted. But within plants, right, we can look at the beautiful orchids of the pink lady slipper, which are very eye-catching, but we can also look at things like grasses, sedges, and trees. We can even look at fungi, bacteria, and slime molds, which are all different, but we lump them together because it's easier for us. But when a mushroom starts fruiting, that is a phenophase, right, because mushrooms exist as hyphae under the soil, and then when conditions in the environment are right, it'll say it's time for me to put up a mushroom and drop out some spores. We also have birds. I know pe bird people are everywhere. You guys, I hope you guys are here. I was really excited. I saw this bird outside my window. The, oh, is it the wood warbler? <laughs> I think I might, it's the yellow rump warbler is what I saw. But it had its very uh, distinct adult non-breeding plumage out. So it, that is a thing that matters with birds and their phenophases. Do they have the plumage of them mating or not? Or are they in their juvenile stage and they don't, don't have adult plumage yet? There's also insects, right? So they have emergent states that we can expect. Uh, if any of you are fishermen, you might look for when the mayflies are hatching to know that the fish will be out because they're trying to feed on the mayflies. They do pupation for a certain amount of days, and they also visit flowers to aid in pollination at a certain amount of time throughout the year. Amphibians will go from a tadpole into a frog, and that is considered a phenophase. And then we also have mammals which I, as a person who loves tiny things, forgot they existed for a minute, but mammals also have phenophases. And right now, most of our mammals are going through the hibernation uh, phenophase, but migration is also considered one. So we have our beautiful little bear in a den and cute little chipmunk, which actually hibernates. They completely like almost freeze themselves and they'll hibernate for a certain amount of days over winter in the leaves. So how can we document phenology, right? And this is something that people go to school for to learn how to do because it's so obscure and scientific and specific, but you can also make a big difference by taking notes in a journal. I actually was just at the Historical Society across the street and they were referencing just regular old people's journals for important dates and things that were happening with trees and flowers. I was really impressed. But you can just take a garden notebook and take uh, pictures and put them in there or just describe what's going on in your garden and see how things change every year. Social media documentation. Uh, you can take photos of organisms that'll be date timed and stamped, right? So that way we know what kind of organisms are doing what at certain times of the year. And we can also join naturalist groups that do forays or surveys and document what and when, because that's the important thing with phenology, when you saw specimens doing a certain type of phenophase. And I wanted to include a bunch of the clubs you are lucky enough to have in West Virginia and should be a member of because they're full of great people. The West Virginia Mushroom Club, the West Virginia Entomological Society, West Virginia Native Plant Society, Appalachian Herpetology, which has a West Virginia uh, Herpetology Club, our society, and then also the Mountain State Birders. And I wanted to show this picture down here where these people are going on a mushroom foray and there were a bunch of experts in attendance who can help you learn about these things and are happy to nerd out with you and tell you all about what's going on with these organisms so you can document them. And there's also a few ways that are more modern, such as the electronic applications on your phone or on your desktop computer that you can contribute to specific programs by making observations with photos. And my favorite one is iNaturalist, which is pretty, I mean, that's an awesome name. It's just for taking photos or sounds and uploading them to a server for people to identify. This is the website, iNaturalist.org, and you can make an account on your desktop or laptop computer, or you can download an app on your phone by going into the App Store or Google Play to look for iNaturalist. 
and you can contribute your expertise of biological organisms and help ID species. You can submit observations with the camera in real time, or you can access photos that are inside of your camera roll on your uh, phone or on your uh, camera that might be time-stamped. So remember, this is a phenology talk, talk, so the time is very important. You can look at GPS location services and know that certain areas are affected by um, climate. Just like, you know, think about if you were in Pocahontas County and how you might see an organism at a different time than someone that's in Monongalia County or all the way down here in Greenbrier County, right? And this is just a fun little video to show you about how you can use iNaturalist. This is just a screenshot of my phone. So this is down here, uh, down, look at that, Greenbank and Durban. All of these little dots are observations that people have made. And you can click on those observations and you can see what they are. So this is one that I clicked on and it'll show you that someone took a picture and the computer guessed that it was the Allegheny Dusky Salamander. And then Sarah, I know she's actually a herpetologist and she was an expert that went in there and agreed. And I know a little bit, so I also agreed and made it into a research grade observation. But you can also make observations with your camera. So those are some spotted lantern fly on my desk. They're not a threat, they're dead. <laughs> but you can take a picture, right? That's what my camera was doing. And it makes this observation and the computer will make a guess. So it's pretty sure that this is the genus Lycorma. But it guessed that because I am all the way down in Lewisburg, right? And there's no spotted lantern fly down here in Lewisburg. So I wanted to increase the accuracy by going up to where that insect was actually collected, which is up in Martinsburg in the Eastern Panhandle. And look at what the computer did now that it had the location observation, right? It had a better algorithm guess of what it saw based off of the date and the location and also what the picture looked like. So here's the top suggestion now of being spotted lanternfly because it was visually similar and seen nearby. And also it takes into consideration the date. Well, the date is wrong, but it takes into consideration the date. So normally when you take a picture, it did implant the date there and you can go in and you can change it in case you go back in your phone and look for something. You can make it an open observation so everybody can see it and know where it was. And you can also make other little side observations. And if you want, you can put it into a project so experts will directly see it. And we'll talk about that in a second. But that's how easy it is to make an observation on iNaturalist. And what happens when you upload that observation is that members of the iNaturalist community will help identify it, a lot like Sarah, the herpetologist, and myself did for that dusky salamander. And super duper experts will be able to see it and confirm it as well. And I asked Heather if I could use her photo and she said yes, but she is an expert that I actually use uh, with my job now when I study wasps and bees and she is a curator on iNaturalist and also identifies, look, she's identified over 21,000 species on iNaturalist of wasps and bees. Oh. Yeah, she's pretty impressive. So she is a real life example of the experts that go to school for all the years so you don't have to, to identify things that you submit to community science projects. And you can also add your observations to projects and so can people like Heather or anyone really. And there are examples of phenology projects on iNaturalist I read already because people are really interested in it. So here's a whole project that's only dedicated to red maples and when they bloom. And there's other phenology projects like here is a um, North Carolina National Park Service. They wanted to see what flowers bloomed in April, May, June, July. And you can set up programs like this for an area and also for a time frame. And iNaturalist has been around for a couple of years now, so it's been able to you know, be made better over the years. And it can use the data that it gets from photos called the metadata. So it'll get that location and the timing for the phenology analysis. And it can make really simple charts for you if you just click on the information of the organism. 
So here's that spotted lanternfly. And if you see this, you should report this because it's an invasive species in West Virginia. We should report it to the West Virginia Department of Ag. But this graph is right in that same page when you learn about the spotted lanternfly. It shows you that it's been observed from April to November. And this helps professionals know that they should be looking for it in the field season of April through November. And really, you know, this is when they can write grants and try to figure out what to do for the next step. And it's getting so good that this app can actually tell you different life stages of the insect. So here's the big, beautiful spotted lantern fly. And underneath it, there's, there's a picture of the adult. This is when it's young and it doesn't have wings yet. And these are the eggs. And so those three different observation types have been entered so these are phenophases, right? These life stages are phenophases that have been marked as being present for different times of the year. And a naturalist might seem like a fun little Pokemon Go thing on your phone, but it's a lot more scientific than that. And because it has people like Heather and myself going on there and identifying things who are professionals and are obsessed with bugs or birds or whatever, it can actually contribute to scientific papers. And since its creation, iNaturalist has been officially cited in more than 2,000 uh, scientific papers. And there'll be, uh, some of them are actually about phenology, and some of them are about uh, climate change and how they're seeing things like fewer butterflies are being observed in the American West because of warmer and drying landscapes. So there's scientists who are looking at climate information, matching it with the normal phenophases of insects or birds or whatever, and it's not matching up and it's showing a decline or in some cases an increase. But if you get really into learning all about this, there is a forum where you can talk all about this stuff and you can learn all about these different papers here. And this talk will be, it is being recorded and it will be sent out. So you can watch it, pause it, copy that down and put it in and learn away. There is another app that's called Nature's Notebook, which is very specific for uh, phenology, where it's tracking information that users like us will put into it. And the USA National Phenology Network will use it in conjunction with organizations like the USGS to map out phenological occurrences in order to predict things that will happen when the climate changes a little bit. But it was made in 2009. And it makes a physic, it has the user make a physical site, right? So you'll go out and you'll map your backyard or you'll map the park you work at. And really it's not as user-friendly as iNaturalist, but it, that's because it's more vetted because it's contributing to a national project. And it's more of a tool for professional land managers, but you can also do it in your own backyard. You do have to take certification courses so you know what's going on, which in some cases is very helpful, right? Because it's a training course to, for you to learn. So you actually know like what a phenophase is for a specific thing. And there's a ton of different projects that you can join on Nature's Notebook to study. And you'll look at the same individual plant or organism on a reoccurring basis that helps scientists know what's going on with phenology. So this person has their park here and they would have things like the sugar maple that they go to to mark what's going on with its phenophases. They would go visit it and they would have it labeled. So that way, every time they come out, it's the same tree and they're making accurate uh, recordings of what's going on with the phenophases. And an example of that, that we're actually going to do here in Lewisburg, where we're going to contribute the information from our park that I described earlier, we're going to take part in the Redbud project and a few others, but this is what the information looks like. So we're going to go out into our 150 acre park. We have a specific area where we're going to look at the same Eastern Redbud trees, and we're going to document what time and date the breaking of leaf buds happened when the leaves were emerging, when they were increasing in size, and other features like when they put out these beautiful little flowers. And this is helping scientists study things like climate change again, but also knowing when insects that come to those trees might be able to get a nectar reward, or when birds go and might be able to utilize it as habitat. And there's really, if you, if you really wanna get into this, it's amazing how many organizations that are professionally funded 
are studying phenology and phenophases. One of them, which is absolutely amazing, is the Xerces Society, which is actually named after this small little butterfly here. This is the Xerces butterfly, which was actually the first um, insect that has been, well, butterfly that has been connected as being extinct because of human activities. So they named this invertebrate conservation group after the Xerces butterfly, and they study all invertebrates. So you can see they have their muscles down here in their hands, and they're a really big part of looking at a phenological survey for monarch migration. Because again, remember, migration is a phenophase. And so when these monarchs are flying from Canada to uh, Mexico and back and forth and in different areas, there, there are people who are contributing observations in their backyards for monarch migration that there will be professional scientists that can then study the data and release reports that are saying that there are fewer or less monarchs this year, and then look at how the weather and climate was associated with that decline or increase. There's another uh, organization, which is, if you're into birds, I'm sure you know this already, but the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is amazing. Uh, they make the Merlin app, I believe. And they have a project I was just emailed today about by my supervisor, which is the feeder watch program, where they're looking to see what kinds of birds are present in this in between period of winter and spring, right? So we have a lot of birds that are um, migrating and also birds that are in their winter non breeding plumage. So it is an active uh, observation session that people it's a it's $18 to participate, but you get things with that it's a membership that helps this project continue on. And also you can make sure that your your observations are going to a project that is, you know, has funded scientists with experience that can analyze the data you're giving them and make, you know, educated observations and reports about it. So phenological trends, we're going to talk about a few things that are really happening in the world and what we're seeing and what kind of inferences we can make from that. But tree leaf out is an interesting one in that trees of certain species are leafing out at different times than they have historically. And remember, bud break is a phenophase. And there was a really interesting uh, quote I read today from uh, actual local West Virginian, George Constance. He wrote the awesome book, Hills, Hollows, and Peepers. And Peepers which is a great book if you want to read it. But there was a quote in there. Sorry, I got something in my throat. A quote in there that says, if oaks before ash, you're in for a splash. If oaks be, if ash before oak, you're in for a soak. And I think that's referring to climactic events, like the weather events that happen depending on which type of tree blooms first. And so there's, this is like, an old, what, an adage, right? <laughs> it's an adage that of making observations that if certain tree species are leafing out or blooming, it's the result of a certain type of clima climactic association. And this influences the exchange of carbon dioxide and water between the atmosphere and the forest on the super scientific realm because these trees are picking up water to utilize in their leaves, right? So this is really affecting our soil water and it's also affecting the movement of gases into the atmosphere because leaves are doing gas exchange. And this is something that can be seen actually in space. So the technology that we have today allows us to use crazy kinds of cameras and LIDAR and all sorts of Landsat information where we can analyze leaf change without having someone go out with their phone or foresters looking on pieces of paper, there's actually satellites that can monitor leaf, um, leaf emergence and bud break in the forest and monitor that it's happening at different times depending on climactic events. And there are impacts of earlier leaf out or changes in leaf out because of uh, climate change or just things in general, but there is year to year variability in timing of leaf out, right? That phrase of the whole 
oak and the soak and the ash and the splash. <laughs> but, but there are trends that these overall are happening earlier and earlier and earlier. And this is an interesting paper that's more so about birds, but I just wanted to show this one figure from it that shows that there are more bird species in habitats that have more different colored trees here. So you can see red spruce, uh, dry oaks, different types of trees. And when you have more different types of habitats and trees that are leafing out at different times, you have more birds. But you know, red spruce is a really vital component of all these ecosystems here in West Virginia. But it's interesting to think about because what do birds eat in the springtime when they're feeding their babies? They're eating caterpillars. So if you have a caterpillar that's really specific and growing on a cherry tree versus a caterpillar that's growing on an oak and they're starting to change the way that they are leafing out over the years, you could have baby birds that are getting a poorer diet because they're only getting one species of caterpillar versus others. And it would just be like us eating hamburgers for two weeks straight versus not having a balanced diet. And there, is, there are scientific papers that are showing that there are differences of between five to 10 days over the past five decades of different leaf out. And not all trees, again, are affected the same way. So you might have a tree species that doesn't care at all about climactic change, but you might have one that's affected by 10 days. Oh, sorry, the mouse moved on me. <laughs> and so many birds and insects use these different times of plants at different stages or phenophases in their own life. And if that's off kilter, it'll have impacts that might be largely unknown at this time, but it could be something that community scientists like you could contribute to understanding. And this is just an interesting thing to think about as a, just to really hit home how different leaf out can be in our part of the world, where soon we're going to experience this and probably, you know, the beginning of March, you'll start to see that invasive species have an earlier phenophase of leaf out than our native trees and shrubs. In early spring, when you start to see green, Everything, pretty much everything that you start to see that's leafing out early, that's all invasive species. So the multiflora rose, the honeysuckles, and the Japanese barberry all leaf out before our native things do. And that shades out our native herbaceous plants and kills them and greatly affects the forest composition that we have here in Appalachia. And just knowing this, because let's say that someone like you goes out and documents this phenophase of this emer honeysuckle which is an invasive species, if you go out and you document that that bush leafed out and had that phenophase 10 days or even it's longer than that, like two weeks before our native trees, that produces quantifiable data that can be transferred to a scientific paper that maybe could help us get things done legally, like a scientific ban on a myrrh honeysuckle being bought in stores. So that's just an example of why pheno phenology matters and having it documented is important. So there's a few examples we're gonna talk about. And one that's really interesting for me is the cherry blossoms in DC. And we don't live too far in West Virginia from DC. And this is something I definitely recommend doing once in your life, uh, going in mid March to April. Uh, oh, that should be March 27th, I think. But going at the end of March to mid-April to see the cherry blossoms bloom in Washington, D.C. is an amazing experience. And the bloom times of these gorgeous flowers, because they're very obvious, have been documented and observed for a really long time, right? So there's kind of like a bias for pretty things. But they've been looked at ever since they were planted way back when in 1912. So that's, you know, just over 100 years. But people have been observing that, you know, generally there's not really too much of a difference, even though we start to see that there are trends with climate change. And even myself, oops, <laughs> I've gone, I've gone to DC and seen that uh, there isn't much difference. So this picture on the left was taken way back when in 1922. And this picture on the right is my picture, but they coincidentally, I didn't plan this for this talk. I was there the same day, but I was there, you know, in 2019. So almost like a hundred years, pretty close. These are blooming at the same time. So that should debunk my whole argument, right? For saying that phenology matters 
and things are shifting and climate change is real and all that, right? Like I, I blew it. I told you that it's not real on this talk, but jokes on you. There is a larger data set where these trees actually came from in Japan because the cherry blossom trees in DC were a gift from the Japanese. And in the city of Kyoto, the blossoms have been blooming since 800. Yeah, they planted them a very long time ago because their civilization is a little bit more established than Americans. And they have been documenting these phenological changes since 800. So they've seen there's been some slight rises and dips, but overall, ever since the industrial revolution, when we started to burn things like coal and have a more commercialized and you know, industrialized life, we have seen the cherry blossoms in Japan have started to bloom about two weeks earlier than they were oh, like for an average, you know, many, many hundreds of years ago. And we have phenological trends of our wildflowers here in Appalachia too. If you are a flower nut like me, you know that this is the spring ephemeral toothwort, the cutleaf toothwort, and this is the uh, yellow trout lily. And there was a study of 111 years of data of the cutleaf toothwort and trout lily that showed that they are experiencing temperature that is warmer and it's affecting the time that they flower. So they're flowering earlier and being more prone to being damaged by frost, which then affects the amount of reproduction that they can do because the point of a flower is to make seeds. So if we have a frost that kills those early blooming flowers, they will die. And this over the long term could really affect the survival of a species in a certain location. And the study that I'm referencing found that there was an average of 0.91 days over a, per decade over the last century where these plants were blooming earlier. So it's about an average of uh, four days for these plants that are blooming earlier. And I know for people, four days, that seems like nothing, right? I barely, four days ago, we were right here. <laughs> Time has not changed for us. But when you are a very tiny insect that only lives for a couple of weeks, five days is a lot, right? So that's like a good chunk of your life. So this is the West Virginia white, which is a endemic um, butterfly that loves cutleaf toothwort. And so if the cutleaf toothwort is blooming earlier and throwing that off key, that means that there are less days for this butterfly to lay its eggs on here and for its babies to eat because of changes to the climate. So another example is of how climate is impacting um, organisms is that with uh, Winter is becoming more mild and shorter. That means that the growing season is extending, but plants don't have the fortitude to last that long. So they seem like they're dying younger, but they're just blooming earlier. They just can't sustain themselves for as long as the season lasts. So that's another example of how climate has been impacting um, plants. Another good example is of how climate is interrupting these special relationships between uh, flowers and insects. This example is of the early spider orchid and the minor bee. So what would typically happen is that the male bees would wake up uh, several days earlier than the female bees and then the spider orchid would kind of look like the female bee and mm. that would influence, um, that would cause pseudo copulation. The bee would fly onto the flower thinking it's their girlfriend and <laughs> help pollinate the bee or pollinate the flower. But now the flowers are opening up later. So by the time that they open up, um, the female bees have woken up already. There's no need for the male bees to be attracted to the flowers now that their mates are awake. So that's another um, influence of climate on um, interspecies relationships. And phenology. And phenology. Another example is something that we don't quite see. Um, insects and other animals in general have a better sight than humans. So they're seeing different things that we don't see. 
Insects find flowers based off of UV radiation patterns that flowers have that go unseen to us, but as a way to respond to the changing temperatures and the increase of UV radiation um, due to the thinning of the ozone layer, um, flowers are now adapting and creating a bigger UV pattern. And this messes up how insects are seeing flowers. There's no longer that contrast. You can see how from the first photo, there are there's a contrast versus the second photo where it, where it looks all black. This is causing insects to find have a harder time finding flowers to help them pollinate. This also reduces their food source because they're not finding their nectar. That's another influence of climate change on phenology and interspecial relationships. And sometimes we're lucky enough with our boring human eyes to be able to see some of those color changes. And this is a recent study that was uh, going on in 2011, and I believe it's still ongoing because I didn't see any publishable data yet, but there were some tidbits of the Virginia water leaf, which is in West Virginia, actually having variations in its color perceived by us because of things like what Ivy was talking about. So it's influencing the phenophases of pollinators being attracted and interacting with our plant that are the key for our ecosystem. This paper um, goes into the effects of climate change on terrestrial birds. Um, one of the things that they talk about specifically is how with climate changing, with the temperatures increasing, birds are trying to find habitats that better fit their thermal needs. Um, with that, they end up moving to habitats that don't have the resources or provide insufficient um, insufficient resources to meet their food and habitat needs. Um, this also is confounded with um, how climate change has been impacting um, disease, um, how it influences birds, and I lost my turn. That's okay, we're gonna move on. Uh, we're gonna move on to another example in Appalachia where I just learned about this uh, today from multiple friends and I have, I'm lucky enough to have a few herpetologist friends uh, to bat these ideas off while I was looking for changes to other organisms be besides the well-studied plants and the well-studied you know, flowering plants, I should say. But there are impacts to amphibian habitat and I'm sure in the news you've expect, ex experienced hearing that with climate change, it's going to be hotter, drier. Well, that's for most of the country. In uh, West Virginia, it's actually expected that we're going to have decreased drought experiences because of more water, uh, because of just different patterns in our climate. But that's not necessarily like a good thing, because if you think about that, that's increasing the amount of erosion and also changing the migration patterns of organisms like salamanders that do depend on set periods of moisture for them to be signaled to move and lay their eggs. So even though they are tiny, they are mighty, they will be found migrating across roads and through the forests to find a mate. And I uh, checked in with a couple of people. It seems that this is both common and slightly rare. On a warm night, you can have, such as January 9th, uh, which seems crazy to me, but on a warm night above 40 degrees, you can expect these salamanders to be walking around. And if these guys are confused by warmer temperatures and think it's time to migrate and mate, they may potentially lay their eggs that are going to get snowed on in two days. These are all like hypotheses at this time, but it is something that a few professionals have noticed that breeding times and migrations are starting to slowly shift. And it's something that is being, you know, talked about being professionally researched in our very salamander diverse habitat of West Virginia. So we're going to close this talk out with talking about some things you can look forward to in spring to hopefully get involved with by making observations to iNaturalist or uh, Nature's Notebook in your backyard or even joining us on our upcoming phenology hike at our park in Lewisburg. These are a few species of plants that are really showy in the spring and they are highly sought after uh, to study because they are very impacted by climate and temperature. This gorgeous 
pink tree over here on the left is Circus canadensis. That's the Latin name for Eastern red bud. And these are all little tiny flowers that are uh, the first things that come out in spring over the, they come out before the leaves on the tree. Another tree species is the red maple, Acer rubrum, that also flowers and they are very uh, obnoxious. I love them, they're great. They're very obvious, I should say. And they, you can, if you look now at the red maples, you can actually see that the branches are starting to turn red. It's one of their phenophases. They're getting ready for sugars to go to these flower buds to pop open when the weather is right. Birds, we can look for my cute little friend. This is the right species. This is the uh, yellow rumped warbler. And this is the phenophase I saw it in. This is the non-breeding plumage. Uh, also the sound of woodpeckers in West Virginia looking for bugs. I mean, I'm sure if you've gone for a walk in the woods in spring when it's a little bit cold out, you'll hear the da -da 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 it's the woodpeckers that are starting to react to another organism's phenophase, insects, right? So there's a bunch of insects that will start to wake up inside of the wood. And so the woodpeckers will start to forage for them. In spring, there are a few fungi that come up. The first one are the scarlet cups. And I actually had uh, someone show me a picture. They've already seen one in January. These guys come up. They're pretty small. They're like that size if you're lucky and they will pop up before the morels, which I know are very famous in this state, but these are also a very sought after spring mushroom that is one of the first ones to come up in, you know, our two different mushroom seasons here in West Virginia. This is an awesome picture of the development, which is a set phenophase of a stonefly. So this is the snow stonefly. And this is the larva that lives in water right now. They are aquatic. And these cool looking, they look almost like intestines, but these cool circles on its back are actually the wing pads. So when it develops a little bit more, those scrunched up intestine looking things there will turn into the wings. So that is a set phenophase that scientists will look for. And these guys, this, was, this picture was taken a few days ago and put on the West Virginia Entomology Society's page, Facebook page. Uh, it, this was a picture that was taken a few days ago. So this is the sign of a phenophase of what's about to happen in spring when the adults come out. And so with that, you can come and join us for our phenology trail hike uh, coming up in spring at our park in Lewisburg. And we're thinking of making another tr phenology trail in our camp location, Camp Waldo in Hinton, West Virginia. And we're going to make a trail. This is kind of a map I stole, but this is what we're working on where we'll have numbered stations. So you can join us as we talk about what's out there at our park and what's going on with the phenophases of different organisms. But also eventually when the park is open to the public more, you'll be able to go for a walk and go and learn about these things on your own with an informational pamphlet. But we're going to be contributing data to uh, the Nature's Notebook for their Red Bud Challenge, the Green Wave, which studies tree bud breakout and also looks at different phenophases they go throughout the year, and Nectar Connectors, which studies plants that bloom for monarchs as adults to utilize as they migrate up to Canada or down to Mexico. And this is not me in a glamour shot. This is uh, Kristen Wickert. Uh, this is our coworker, Kevin Johnson. He works a lot with the camp, but is part of our educational team. And this is Ivy. <laughs> so we have a great time. This is our, uh, our office down in Lewisburg. And we're excited to teach all you guys all about nature for many years to come. If you have any questions, you can email me or Ivy with your questions. Here are our email addresses. And you can also type something in the chat. And we would love to answer them and have a conversation, but uh, we appreciate you. And we're going to check out the chat for a couple of minutes. So give me those questions about nature. Do we have any? We have one question. All right, let's do it. About the book title. Um, it, the one by George Costanz. Yes. It is called Hollows, Highlanders, and Peepers. Yes, thank yes. you. It's, uh, it's great. I just started it and the imagery of very special places mm -hmm. in West Virginia is awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, I love reading about the geology between Gore, Virginia and 
Cape and Bridge. Cape and Bridge. There we go. It, it's an awesome book. Thank you for helping me out, Shelby. As someone who's from Florida, um, I think this book is so enlightening in terms of learning about Appalachian, uh, Appalachia. Um, it's specifically about Appalachian mountain ecology. So it goes into the history of it and how, you know, it might have come to be and how species are the way that they are. And it um, kind of talks about evolution, how that could have shaped how wonderful and wild the mountains are. <laughs> But oh, yeah. there it is. I found it on my many book. There we go. This is a promotion for the book. <laughs> this is what, oh, not my camera. <laughs> this is the book. It's a very nice book. Yeah, okay. it's great. We have some more questions. Okay. Um, how can I watch out for more of your classes? So we That's have jam. <laughs> <laughs> so we have our website appheadwaters.org. That's where um, all the calendar events are available on that website. Um, we also have a Facebook page that we um, try to update with events that we're holding. Mostly, those are the two places that you'll find our events and anything that we're doing. Mm -hmm. We have been reaching out. We are a pretty uh, new organization and we have been reaching out to uh, news teams to try to get our stuff advertised a little bit more. We're learning and I think it's going well. Mm -hmm. uh, we can like just tell you about something we <laughs> recently did. Yes. Um, we've organized and are going to be doing a educators workshop that's called Climate Change in My Backyard. It is on our website where you can sign up on ad event a lot like you did for this lecture today, where we'll be teaching educators that can be formal, informal, homeschool, public or private, how to engage their class with activities that talk about nature and talk about climate change and how that affects them in West Virginia. Uh, we keep it very fun and enlightening, but also educational. So it meets criteria that are the school standards. Uh, obviously, that depends on counties, but it, we try to be as considerate as we can from that. So we are having an educator workshop coming up. We have a bunch of walks uh, around our park property, and uh, there's more to come, but it's on the website, so you'll just have to scroll down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have another question. Is there any fear of giving exact locations of protected or rare species with iNaturalist or the exact GPS locations not given or are exact GPS locations not given? Yes. So uh, that is one of the reasons I'm just going to be honest with you all. I, took, I was snobby for a very long time about iNaturalist. I didn't use it uh, because uh, that was one of my fears. But I realized that my observations would actually be very helpful, especially because people like Ivy and I, uh, we work with like the Forest Service and other organizations where we get to go out to places that people necessarily don't. And sometimes we visit people's private property too, and we know what we're looking for. And so it's important for someone like me who has the information to know that that is a, you know, I don't know, a Kentucky... Uh, orchid lady slipper, right? Rare. Uh, I should be the one that makes that observation, but you can edit where it is and you can make comments and you can obscure or make the observation private. So I actually just uploaded a Kentucky lady slipper that I found this summer and I purposely put in the notes, this is not the real location. Uh, I also took it upon myself to alert the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and wherever it was. And so the professionals knew where it was in order to protect it. And, but it also was something that, you know, I can tell the state department that works with it, that it's there, but there might be a scientist that's trying to gather information about that. That's not directly associated with the Department of Agriculture or whatever. So if they see that on there and they see my note that says, you know, this is not the real location, you can contact me for more information. As a professional, I can say, you know, I can check that person out on Google and be like, okay, they're an actual botanist at this university. 
uh, I don't mind having a conversation with them about where this is because they're obviously a person who cares. If someone were to say, hey, where is that? I want to put it in my garden. I'm going to be like, no, <laughs> like you don't get to know where that is. So I don't have that fear anymore because they've actually made things to protect rare plants. I also don't put ginseng or ramps on there because I'm not, I'm not going to help destroy our state even more. <laughs> The person responded. I don't know if I should ever do that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I have been snobby as well and didn't know about the location in it. So thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah. Um, I could talk about that forever, but the uh, people the you know, iNaturalist has gotten a lot of attention now and more and more professionals use it. So I think it's better to put it on there and obscure the location and then uh, let that observation contribute to protecting the species instead of it being something that will disappear when you, you know, disappear. <laughs> it's true, right? Yeah. I'm so jealous of all these botanists that have lived here forever. And then like, you know, all that information just disappears when they pass. It's really sad, but yeah, with iNaturalist, we can live on forever. Yes. <laughs> What else do you got? Um, I think that is all for the questions. We got uh, quite a few people saying thank you for the great presentation thank you. and that they loved our enthusiasm. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. Uh, we will be doing more talks like this and also uh, more in-person walks. So if you're ever coming down to Lewisburg, uh, we have some great food. We have a lot of fun stuff going on down here, especially in the summer. And you can come to our park for our leaded guided tours and eventually you know that might change a little bit but uh things are happening and we're really excited and we really appreciate you for joining us tonight thanks for spending your thursday night with us mm -hmm. and if you have any questions like i said there's our information feel free to question send us a few questions and we'll see you outside hopefully bye, bye.